Assalamu alaikum ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to HIPAA, welcome back. <laughs> uh, today I think we have a very interesting subject. It is uh, one of the um, most noble <laughs> subject we talk about is about our environment and we have our uh, respected guest here, Qadir von Lohausen. <laughs> <laughs> from uh, fresh from Amsterdam. Uh, I hope you will enjoy uh, nice time with us here. Uh, as you know, and as usual for the new people here, we will spend about two hours together. Uh, there will be a 10 minutes or 15 minutes break in between for the prayer or for some uh, snacks and beverages outside. Uh, for gents, if you want to pray, there is a prayer room exactly next to the reception. And for the ladies downstairs in the ground floor. Uh, for the ladies here? Okay. Then for the ladies here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, and uh, after all, we will get, you will get your um, certificate also as usual. Uh, don't forget that this uh, lecture is live streamed on our channel on YouTube. If you know a friend or uh, a family member who is couldn't make it to come here, please send them the link. And uh, thank you very much, and enjoy the lecture. Please. Well, thank you very much for uh, having me. I don't know if I'm fresh from Amsterdam, because uh, it's <laughs> there's always a jet lag, and you arrive at midnight. So, um, But... Uh, Yes, thank you for uh, for having me. Uh, it's been a while that I've been in Dubai, so uh, pretty shocked what I'm seeing because it was more than 10 years ago that I was here. So, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself uh, to start with. Uh, uh, I'm a photographer that you probably know. I'm also more, uh, also becoming more a filmmaker nowadays. This is partly because I'm, I've always been interested in film, but also to to yeah to kind of survive uh, often photography is not uh, not enough anymore um working for uh, i started my professional career uh, in 1988 my first very first uh, trip was uh, to cover the first intifada uh in uh, i it started, as you know, probably know, in December 87, and I arrived there in February 88. So uh, that was the first time I, I really was a professional photographer. I'm uh, self-educated because in 1982, uh, when I finished high school, I wanted to study photography, uh, uh, and I applied to two institutes in the Netherlands to, to study it, but I was declined by both of them for motivation and quality. <laughs> So uh, uh, I decided, I didn't touch the camera actually for a couple of years because I was very angry. And then, uh, uh, and then I picked up the, ca the camera again. And I actually, then I started to understand the, the power of the, of the camera and the power of the image. Before that, I was just intrigued by the, this was obviously the analog time. I'm originally a black and white photographer, always using film, printing my own images. Um, so I was intrigued by the, by the mystery and the chemical process uh, of, uh, of what would happen in a dark room, but it was only a couple of years later that I started to understand that, uh, that the camera was actually a very strong weapon in, uh, in telling stories. Um, I covered a lot of conflicts. Uh, I've, n I've never considered myself to be a news photographer. Uh, but I did cover a lot of conflicts in, uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq and uh, Palestine and Kashmir and uh, Colombia and elsewhere in the world. Uh, and since uh, I would say 10, 15 years, I've been focusing much more on, on long-term projects. So with stories which I work on uh, for, for a long time. It kind of started while I was covering conflicts in, uh, in Africa in Sierra Leone, in Mozambique, and in Angola, that I started to understand that uh, mineral resources were actually uh, fueling those conflicts. So that was kind of my first big project where I 
started to talk about the diamond industry and basically followed the diamonds from, from the mines in several African countries to the consumer markets in, uh, in uh, Europe and, uh, uh, and in the US. So I started, you know, photography is a great, great medium, but it sometimes has a handicap that you sometimes can't sell enough with, with a picture. And obviously there's the famous saying that uh, a picture is it has more value than a thousand words, but sometimes you need the context and sometimes you need to explain. And uh, that's the diamond story really, I think it resonated with people because people started to understand that this was not just brutal wars over there, but the, those brutal wars were fought at that time to, to control territory where the di diamonds were found. And obviously we are the ones who purchased the diamonds. So, you know, I mean, I tried to link that up. Um, I'll uh, speak about, as you said, uh, environment, or, or I would rather say uh, uh, the climate crisis. You know, I don't really like to use the words climate change anymore because it kind of feels that it's like a natural process. Um, and I think uh, I consider it to be a real crisis. Um, and uh, I consider photography to be really important because it's, it's, it's almost like visual proof um, uh, what you can show in photography because there's lots of documents, lots of scientific reports about what's happening to our climate, but it seems often that people only start to understand when they really see what's happening. Um, there's always a problem as a photographer is how do you f find a story, how do you find a project, and then there's the problem when, when, when is the end, when do you, uh, when do you stop it actually. So, um, uh, and how do you get the idea, because you know, what I'm going to show you is, a, is a, a project about the consequences of the rising sea level. Uh, I call the, uh, the title, I call it After Us the Deluge, and I just understood that you have a very famous expression in Arab as well, which is kind of the same, has the same meaning. Um, I'm from the Netherlands, as I said, so I live uh, happily below the sea level, like many of my uh, Dutch uh, colleagues do, <laughs> and my fellow Dutchmen do. Uh, we consider ourselves to be very safe, you know, we had a major, major flood disaster back in 1953. 1900 people died at that time, which is a lot for such a tiny, tiny country. But since then uh, we fortified our coast and, uh, and we became kind of experts in the world in, in coastal management and, uh, and how to protect coastal, coastal zones. Um, so, you know, I mean, this was back in 2011. I was working, uh, by the way, if, uh, I, w I don't mind if you have questions in between. I rather uh, have kind of a conversation and that you ask questions in between than instead of having a, like a Q&A hour. <laughs> really? <laughs> You know, I mean, if, if I look back on, uh, on some of the stories I covered, um, you th there's a very thin line between being brave and naive <laughs> and stupid. Um, so, you know, I mean, I, I, I covered a lot of stories, but I, uh, some, some of the stories, if I look back to them now, I think I was a bit stupid too. I took very high risks. Uh, sometimes and, th and that's the problem you face as a photographer because if you're covering a conflict you cannot uh, report from your hotel room uh, uh, like, uh, like maybe a, a, a writer can do, a journalist can do. You have to be there, you have to be on the front. So um, sometimes my nationality helps, sometimes it doesn't uh, and I think it became more dangerous nowadays because you know I think you, it's fair to say that 20 years ago, as a journalist, you were probably more safe 
because you were seen as, as someone independent and, uh, and someone you shouldn't touch. Uh, nowadays, a journalist is often part of the conflict, you know, either for political reasons, ransom, kidnapping, uh, whatever. So I think it became much more dangerous. Um, so, you know, You, usually, usually the way I, I was always, I've always been freelance, so I've never been a staff photographer, I've never had a contract, so usually the way I, I worked was that I would save money to buy myself a ticket to go somewhere, and then I would sell the stories afterwards to different magazines and newspapers. Um, Yeah. Well, the, I mean, you are asking how, how all the stories I did, whether they were environmental or the, all the conflicts, uh, uh, how, they, how they shaped me as a personality, right? As a, as a person. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I I'm covering less conflicts now, and part of the reason is because I lost too many colleagues. Uh, you know, in the when I was young, you kind of think that you are, that that n nothing will happen to you. But if you grow older, obviously you start to have people around you and colleagues who who or who get wounded or even killed. So you know, I started to understand that that when I was young, it was I, it felt like it was my own responsibility. If I choose to die, I, d I choose to die. But then I started to realize, seeing the impact, if somebody would lo if if some of my colleagues would would die, what what kind of impact it has on his or her family and friends, and so it's not totally yours. And I think it, it uh, you know, I mean, I have many colleagues, uh, you know, I mean, when I was like 20, 30 years ago, we were not talking about post-traumatic stress syndrome. You know, you you were supposed to be like you know, courageous and brave and, and, and it wouldn't touch you, but obviously it does touch you. So, you know, I think, I think I'm still okay. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, 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 I saw a lot of terrible things and that, that definitely shaped me and affected me and made me at least more aware of what's going on in this world. Uh, but, but there's a personal toll to it, for sure. Um, so, you know, uh, as I was saying about, uh, you know, being living in the Netherlands on below the sea level, I heard the stories of, uh, of that the sea level was rising and that, that it would, could have a serious effect on this planet. But I, including myself, I considered this to be somewhere for the future, you know, next generation, the generation after who has to deal with this. So. Uh, it was in 2011, and I was working on another project, which was called Via Pan Am. And I was traveling from the very tip of, of South America to the very north of Alaska, overland. And the project was to tell contemporary stories about migration, because I wanted to tell, I wanted to show the normality of migration, right? There's a lot of discussion in Europe and the US and elsewhere and, and migrants, they have a very negative connotation now. And I wanted to show the normality because in the end of the day, uh, if we all go back to our roots, we are always from some, we, we are a migrant from somewhere. So um, I was traveling and I came to these beautiful islands uh, in Panama on the Caribbean side. They called the San Blas Islands, Cunayala as they actually are called. And I came there and um, I was interviewing people and people said uh, to me, we are being evacuated. And I said, why are you being evacuated? And they said, the sea is coming. 
And I said, what do you mean, the sea is still? Well, you know, the sea, sea level is, is rising. There are more frequent storms. Uh, we're losing our land. We can't grow crops anymore. That was the, I felt stupid, but that was the first time that I realized that this was not an issue of tomorrow or in a few decades, that this was an issue of today. So that's, that's how this project was born. That's how I started to research, because I thought if it's happening there, it must be happening elsewhere as well. So that's how, it, uh, how this started, and, um, and it became a long journey, actually. Um, Maybe I should show some images, right? I mean, what's, what's obviously great as being a photographer is that you are often a witness of history, uh, that, you, that you are present, that you are seeing incredible things. Um, but it also means, like, like for me, re research for the stories I do is, is, you know, takes much more time than the actual shooting. So to, to research this project, uh, and have an understanding what it means if a sea level is rising, what it means, what, uh, what impact it has, what causes is, uh, co uh, you cost a took a lot of time, actually. So in originally, up till recently, the main reason for the sea level to rise is because the uh, oceans are warming up. And if water warms up, it expands. So that was the main reason uh, for the sea level to rise. It was not a lot. And then this has been overtaken since the last couple of years by the melting of the ice sheets of Greenland and Antarctica. So um, here we are in Greenland, a uh, huge island. Uh, it's covered by ice, which is about, at some point, three kilometers thick. Uh, so there's a lot of ice. If, if the whole of Greenland, just the for for the understanding if the whole of Greenland would melt, the sea level would rise seven meters in the world. And if Antarctica would melt, it would rise 86 meters. Well, that's not what we're going to experience. But uh, you know, low-lying coastal regions, including where we are today, or even worse, living below sea level like we do in the Netherlands, it will have an impact, even if it's a, if it's a fraction from that. Um, so um, uh, Greenland was uh, was important um, uh, to show. It's uh, difficult sometimes because you know how do you show such volumes of ice to be to be melt uh, to be melting. This was an interesting situation, though, because you know my camera is my passport, so. You know, it, it brings me into situations where otherwise you would have never been into. And this was, uh, I was able to join a scientific expedition to uh, the middle of the ice sheet of Greenland. Uh, it's an international scientific e expedition. I'm here at an altitude of 2,800 meters above sea level, of which, uh, uh, sorry? It's right in the middle of, of Greenland, in the middle of nowhere. It's, uh, you know, there's nothing. There is just a white desert. The only way to get there, there are two uh, C-130 planes in the world, which belong to the U.S. Uh, Air Force, uh, which have skis. So they can land on, uh, on the ice. It's the longest runway in the world, because it takes a very long time to take off. Um, and what they are doing here is that they are dri drilling right through the ice sheet till they reach the bedrock. And they're doing this uh, exactly at this location. This is where you see the drill um, because they discovered that there are ice flows uh, on Greenland. Basically, it means that there are giant rivers. So they're not glaciers, but they're, glaci they're, they're rivers which have a source. This is the source of the, of the ice flow. 
and it moves. It moves quite quick, actually. This moves uh, every day I woke up there, I moved 15 centimeters closer to the ocean. <laughs> the, whole, the whole camp, the whole sheet is moving. So they, they are drilling uh, through this, uh, which is, and this is what they take, they take the ice cores out, and it is, was just amazing because it's what you see here is a history book of the world uh, of the climate. Uh, the ice cores you see here, they're coming from about 1,500 meters deep, and the ice is about 20,000 years old. And what they can see actually in those cores, they can see exactly when there was uh, ice age, when there were warmer periods, they, you see l small layers with a different color. That's when there's been gigantic uh, volcanic eruptions, uh, when the whole ice sheet was covered with, uh, with ashes. So, uh, but what they are discovering is that the deeper they go, the quicker it moves. So, the, you know, they were supposed to finish already last year, but due to COVID, they had to postpone the expedition. So, uh, but it looks like the report will tell us that, uh, which is the unfortunate story about the climate uh, crisis, right? Uh, we tend to think that things will be not so bad as they are predicted, but every new report predicts that it's getting worse. So this will be an additional uh, reason why the sea level is, is rising quicker than, uh, uh, than we anticipated so far. Um, well, ba Bangladesh is, you know, if people think about floods and s cyclones and storms, they often uh, relate this to Bangladesh. Um, it's very similar to the Netherlands, you know, low-lying, flat, there's no uh, high ground in, in Bangladesh. Um, by the way, the, the maps which are in between is uh, what happens, uh, this is if, if the sea level rises one meter, so everything that's orange gets flooded, uh, and this is what happens if it rises uh, um, meters. Um, so it's, it's very similar to the Netherlands except that, uh, that the Netherlands is, uh, is much better protected. Uh, uh. Oh, that's ventilation. Huh? <laughs> I thought it was the noise. Um, uh, what's funny is that often people said to me, why do these people live in the Delta? You know, it's dangerous, they should not live in the Delta, they should uh, move somewhere else. Uh, obviously, people live in the Delta because it's very fertile land, right? It's, it's great for agriculture. Um, and it's often people uh, who said that uh, to me who are from the Netherlands, so, so I would reply, well, li we live in the Delta as well. It's even worse, we live in the Delta below sea level. Um, but the issue in, uh, in Bangladesh is that uh, it's one of the most densely populated countries in the world. It's uh, about 160 million people. And as I said, there's no high ground. So the question is really uh, where people will have to go to. Because, you know, I mean, the, the, I think that's often what we forget, and that's what I try to address in this work as well, is that we, theoretically, we can do a lot. Uh, you know, we can protect coastal regions, we can build dikes, we can fortify it, but the clock is ticking. And uh, there's just, for many regions in the world, there's just not no time to, uh, to fix this. So y that means like in the Delta, in Bangladesh alone, there's about 50 million people, and it looks like they probably have to be evacuated by 2050, uh, 2040. Uh, so that's in like 20, 30 years, and, and nobody really knows where, where they would go to, have to, where the people will have to go to. Um, and that's a, that's a main issue that where, where people, you know, in a country like the U.S., if uh, Miami gets flooded, 
if Miami will be submerged, people can still go somewhere else in the country. There are many places in the world where people don't have anywhere to go. Um, so they go to the cities already, right? Many, many people move, move to the big cities already, but they lost their livelihood. You know, they used to be fishermen or farmers, and they end up in the city, usually in uh, slum areas, and uh, they, they can't, can't find the work anymore that they, that they were doing. So, you know, it's, it's a re really difficult. Um, so, um, I used, I started to use quite a lot of aerials. Initially, um, when I started, I, I, I understood that I needed, I needed images from above, because from above you see much better what the impact is on the, uh, on the, uh, on the on the coast if it's uh, if it's eroding so uh, into in the beginning when I was doing this there was no real there were drones but they were very big very expensive uh, very difficult to handle so it, initially I had a kite so somebody helped me to to build like a rig so I had a small camera and a kite uh, to, uh, to to do my aerials I couldn't see on the screen what I was doing but I was kind of angling with the wind, hoping that I would, uh, would get it right. I'll, there's some, I'll show you some of the kite pictures when they come. So I, I often try to connect, right? So I, I visited people like here in Bangladesh. I visited families who remained in the Delta and part of the family moved to this big city. So I went to find the, re the family members who moved and tried to connect the dots. So these are uh, people, I mean, they climate refugees, right? I mean, they, they fled from the islands in the Bay of Bengal uh, they went to Chittagong, Cox Bazar in, uh, in Bangladesh, to the big cities. Uh, and they're actually protesting uh, because they are being evicted uh, from their neighborhood because uh, real estate is to be built. And, uh, and they were, well, they were trying to remain. I spent a couple of days with them. And uh, the last morning I was there, the whole area burned down. Um, and they were homeless again. They said it was the project developer who set it on fire to, to get them out. But, uh, you know, I met so many people who have moved already like five times. Uh, so it's sometimes uh, tough to see. So this is where it all started. This is the, uh, the islands in, uh, in Panama. Um, so, as I said, I was there in 2011. I was told, people were telling me that they were uh, being evacuated. Uh, it's called Cunayala because it's the land of the Cunas, which is the indigenous population of Panama. Uh, they even fought a war with the, with the central government in the early 20s to gain uh, independence. They didn't get independence, but they got uh, autonom uh, autonomy. So, they live on the islands, they fishermen, coconuts uh, they sell, uh, but they also have a, 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 a part of the coastline, and that's higher ground. So that's where they are, we're supposed to go to. Um, this was in 2011, they were supposed to be evacuated in 2012, 2013. I came back there once in 2015 or 16. They were still there, and they are still there today. They're still on the islands. Um, so y they're looking at the at the mainland, uh, and these are the plans for uh, for building the co rebuilding the communities on the mainland. And this is where it actually is supposed to be. There's a school, there's a hospital now, but the money disappeared, the funding disappeared, so there's still no houses. Um, and that was because I I came back several times. I came back to some regions more than once. And it was interesting to see that 
originally when I would speak to people, they, they would tell me that there's no way I'm going to go. You know, this is the land of my forefathers. This is where I was born. This belongs to me. I'm not going. When I came back a couple of years later, m most of the time people were desperate to leave uh, because it's becoming so urgent now uh, for, for some reasons that people are really they're scared uh, because there's nowhere to go. <coughs> what, was, what I did want to do in this project was to show also that this was not something exotic, something from far away, that this was only happening in Bangladesh or in, uh, in, in the Pacific. Uh, so I also wanted to show that it was closer to my home at least. So this is just opposite the Netherlands, it's the United Kingdom. Uh, it's the East Coast, East Coast just above Hull. And uh, the coast is eroding. Nothing new about the coasts eroding because they always erode. But because of the, uh, I mean, this, this when I was there, this was the coastal road which existed the year before. So, uh, so this this is uh, was a kite, by the way. So this stops just in my. You, this is the kite line. This is It's me fly flying the kite. <laughs> were, you, were you asking a question? No, I was commenting. So this was taken by Cameron Martin on a kite. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, to, to uh, you know, I mean, well, it's an interesting question because, you know, a lot of people have said to me, me about, ba they, they said about to me about Bangladesh, uh, they shouldn't live in the Delta. Uh, so, you know, why are these people there? Uh, but at the same, and, and, and many, many people ask me, did you, Bangladesh must have been really depressing for you. And it was actually not. Uh, because Bangladesh is actually uh, one of the few countries in the world who is really trying to address this issue. They, they develop uh, a, a delta plan uh, to not only protect coastal regions, but also to rebuild infrastructure and relocate people and give them an opportunity to rebuild their lives. You know, to, to learn a different profession or, you know, they take, they're taking this into account. It's not just building, building dikes. Again, you know, I mean, the clock is ticking, so, but, but yeah, it's a very serious plan. It's a, they invested, uh, they're investing $40 million in it. Uh, so, you know, in that sense, uh, it, th there is some hope for at least uh, some regions of, of Bangladesh. Um, which is maybe not the case uh, for this country. C you pronounce it Kiribati. Mm. Anyone knows where it is? Country? It's a country. It's a country which is actually uh, has the size of India. <laughs> Becoming a quiz. <laughs> <laughs> The, the, the big difference is that most of the uh, area is governed by ocean. So Kiribati is one of the island nations in the Pacific. It's uh, located exactly between Fiji and Hawaii, uh, really, really in the middle of nowhere. Um, um, about 100,000 people live there, but the highest point in Kiribati is, uh, is about one, one and a half meter above sea level. Um, so, you know, it's, it's one of the places where I felt scared sometimes. Because, you know, you re it's so far away, uh, you can get there, there's once a week, twice a week, there's a flight from Fiji, uh, which is usually overbooked. And then there's, I think, two ferries a year 
to features. So there's, you know, the, the, their lifeline is, is, is a plane. Um, it's not too far from Tonga, which most people know now where Tonga is after the volcanic eruption. Um, so it's atolls. Atoll is ba basically an atoll is, uh, is the edge of a crater of a vol vol volcano, right? So you have the beautiful lagoon with the beautiful colors. That's the, the, the former crater. Um, so, you know, I mean... Um, it's beautiful, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's scary because uh, it's going very quick now. Uh, it means that, uh, um, you know, they can't grow crops anymore, you know, because if the seawater intrudes all the time, the soil gets saline. There's no safe drinking water anymore because, uh, because it, uh, uh, it gets uh, brackish, gets salty. Um, the reefs which protect the islands uh, are dying because of the warming of the ocean. If the reef dies, that's the first buffer to protect the beaches. And the beaches are beautiful, but the beaches are there to prevent erosion. So almost all the beaches are gone already. And uh, yeah, this is like a typical, you know, you have high tides usually twice a day, and then you have spring tide once a month. When which, f which the moon is extra high. So this is a uh, pretty high tide, and this is, uh, you know, people bring their sandbags uh, to, protect, uh, to protect themselves and to... <sighs> yeah, this... Like three weeks. Yeah, it floods. Um, you know, and, and what was great, they had a really great president, I thought. He was called Anoto Tong. He was a former fisherman, but he became the president. And he was the big campaigner in the world to ask for attention for the plight of the people in the Pacific. Because there, this Kiribati is a, is, a, is a nation, but Tuvalu is one, Tonga is one. Uh, the, you know, there are many, many na island nations which, which uh, will cease to exist. So he, he was really campaigning to, to get the attention uh, and that, that, you know, they pay the price for what especially Europe and the U.S. Uh, have caused over the decades. You know, they, there's maybe five cars on the, on the <laughs> in the whole country. They have no emissions, but they pay a very high price. And, uh, you know, it's being predicted now that, uh, that they will have to evacuate everyone by, uh, in, in 20, 30 years. And they don't know where to, because wh what do you do with a country that stops to exist, right? Where do you go with the people? Where do you go with uh, what happens to the culture? What happens to the language? Um, um, yeah, I can't remember. So are they dependent on other nations? To they are depending on other nations. New Zealand is uh, is helping them. You know, I mean, the, 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 there was a a great story, great sad story to uh, to this former president because he thought, okay, if no one is going to help us, we're going to act ourselves. So. He purchased land on Fiji from the Anglican Church. Uh, the government of Kiribati sent out a press release and said, we are in the future relocating the people from Kiribati to this land on Fiji. Because we can't go anywhere, so we just buy la land. They didn't discuss it with the government of Fiji, so the, was the government of Fiji was not very amused. Uh, <laughs> so they, they changed, they, in the end it became that they purchased this land to grow crops to export back to Kiribati to feed the people. 
but it kind of shows the urgency. Uh, and that, that this is not being addressed, you know? I mean, this is their lifeline, the international airport. If they lose this strip, there's, um, yeah. <coughs> um, so, um, I was planning to go uh, to go back to Kiribati, um, but they had presidential elections uh, a couple of years ago, uh, like two years ago, and they have a new president, and they he is nicknamed already the Trump of the Pacific. Because he den he denies that that there's an issue, and he denies that that uh, uh, that the country needs to be relocated, and he decided that the part of the problem is the media, so all media is banned from Kiribati. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Oh my God. Yeah. So um, so instead, I went uh, to the neighboring country. Uh, which is the Marshall Islands. Um, you might remember the Marshall Islands because uh, it was the Americans in the 40s and 50s who did their nuclear tests there. <coughs> um, sorry. Um, so very similar problem. The good thing for the Marshallese is that the that the U.S. finally recognized uh, their wrongdoing there, uh, and uh, they are paying the Mar Marshall Islands compensation every year. And if someone, a Marshallese, wants to move to the U.S., you get automatically a residency. Um, so many went. This is the capital. Um, many went. Um, but many came back as well, because they, uh, and people came back because they uh, just couldn't get used to such a different life. They felt that they were losing their culture, their language, people were ending up in crime. So although the situation is, is not very good here, people came, still came back because they just couldn't cope with uh, their new life. Do we need to break? I mean, in general, people were, were, were really happy that to see me because, you know, I mean, especially in, in locations like this, people really felt that they're not being hurt. Um, so actually, I was, I was received very well. And, uh, you know, people were very eager, actually, to share their stories. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's like, <laughs> this is the capital, eh? I mean, the, this is one side. The, this is one side of the ocean, and this is the other side of the ocean. This is how narrow it is, and you know, I mean, they people are they they build these walls themselves. They often build it from coral, which is not a very good idea. Uh, not because, yeah, it's not a good idea because it's coral, but it's also not a good idea because the reef is the is the is the barrier. Uh, so. Um, This one, uh, this was in my drone time. <laughs> so, with the kite, I couldn't. Well, I couldn't really control it, you know. So, no, you could. I couldn't shoot video with the kite because it would like uh, dance all the time in the wind. So that was not possible. I could only shoot stills, and then I, uh, I didn't have a live view, but I. Program. I had a small Nikon camera in it, and, and I would program it so it would take a picture like every two seconds, and it would like uh, 
and it could go like this and this. But then the rest was just the wi wind. The problem with a kite, <laughs> the problem with a kite is that you can't fly it if there's no wind, and you can't fly it when there's a lot of wind. So there have been situations where I've been waiting a week or even longer for, for the good wind. Um, no, it was kind of a normal kite. Yeah. Sorry? Sm small, it was a Nikon uh, compact camera. Yeah. Yeah, because it, it was, you know, the, the kite had to carry it. The, the heavier the camera, the more wind you would you need, and then it would. Uh, would The rig was kind of, you know, was yeah, was stabilized by by ropes, so we would kind of be be so it would stabilize kind of, uh, uh, how do you call it? It wouldn't be like this. Yeah. <coughs> huh? Yeah, well, uh, you know, I mean, but what I had to learn very quickly, you know, I mean, normally as a photographer, you you think about the light, you know, which getting good light now. Uh, with this, I my my main guide uh, for this story was a side table, so I knew exactly where, when it was low tide, high tide, and when it was higher tide. Because, you know, I made the mistake in the beginning that, that I would, like, interview someone and he would stand at this house and he would, would, he would say to me, you should have been here last week, the water was here. And then I was looking at the sea and it was somewhere there. So, I, you know, I thought if, if, I, if you can show what happens at a normal high tide already today, you can imagine what it means if the sea level will rise one meter, two meter, three meter. Um, will break before Miami. Yeah. <laughs> yeah? I have a question. I, um, I have never been a You know, I mean, the human species are strange, right? Because we, how is it possible that we know that this is happening, but we still think that this will not happen to, uh, to us? So it's the same in the Netherlands, you know? We think it will happen e everywhere in the world, but it will not happen to us. Um, so, you know, it, it, there's always like this, which I don't, I really, question, I ask my, this question a lot to myself, so we know exactly what to do and, and we know we are too late already, you know, it's not that we can turn this around anymore, mm -hmm. we reached a tilting point that we could, could have reversed this process, uh, was mid-80s already, it's a long time ago already, <coughs> but we can, you know, we, we can at least try to ensure that for the next two generations, things are still, that they are still on a livable planet. But, um, um, and I understand that it's, it's big, right? I mean, what, what can I do as an individual to solve this problem? But, you know, I, at the same time, if we talk about the climate, what's happening to our climate, by now we all know that we kind of have to fly less, drive less, think about what we eat, you know, we, we personally, if I think if I ask each of you, you kind of know how you c probably could reduce your footprint. Um, but the problem is, that's how I explain it. Uh, I'm, I'm from a generation, and if you're in from Dubai, or it's probably the same. Uh, welfare always meant, you know, 
economic growth was always related to welfare. So if the economy would do well, we would do well and we would do better. So we are used to, I see, we are in a comfort zone which is very difficult to do one or two steps back. It's not what, what's in our DNA anymore. So I think that's, that's part of the, the problem. And, uh, and I think part of the problem is also if I look at the Netherlands, you know, we have, all, we have the knowledge, we have the technology, we have the means to act, and still we don't. And I, I often wonder that sometimes maybe even democracies are failing here, uh, because we choose a government for four years, uh, but if you are a political party and you hope to be in the government, then you have to put on the table what needs to be done uh, to, to avoid cer certain disasters, you're not going to win the elections. Because people will not be elected because you're making their life harder. You will make their life harder. It will, it will cost a lot of money. Uh, so it will not, it will not uh, gain your popularity. I mean, it's maybe a bit, little bit of simplistic to say it like this, but it's often how you see it because, you know, I mean, if, if, if there's a four-year period that the government is in power, then it, after two years they are all already campaigning mm -hmm. for the next elections. Um, so I think we know what to do, but I don't know. I mean, you, can you give me an answer? I agree, I agree. I mean, uh, if what the world spends on COVID, if we would spend the same amount <laughs> to address these issues, it would, it would make a huge difference. Yeah. projects were invested in sustainability were they like uh, used for the benefit of any researchers yeah i'll i'll tell you after the All right. after i wanted to ask this but let's wrap it up yeah thank you cheers <coughs> I saw.
Yeah. Sorry, I got lost in. At least there's still someone. Do we need to, should we start or the, the word? Yeah. Um, <laughs> let, let me get on my thought. Um, Miami. It was, um, was kind of an interesting story to it because uh, what the the problem is always as a freelancer how do you pay for projects like that you know if it's a small story it's 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 kind of possible if it's becoming a bigger project it's becoming more problematic because you know the, it required a lot of travel spending time being patient so i was pretty lucky that uh, uh, quite in the beginning uh, when I, when i did two trips i, I uh, the new york times uh, decided to uh, to partner with me so they paid for part of the trips and all the expenses so that made it really great so what would happen is that I would um, I would do the research about a particular region or a country I would present them the research and then they would discuss it in the editorial team uh, if they would run this part of the story so um, I read a bit about Miami and about the U.S. and that, that the U.S. East Coast is, is not very well protected or many coasts in the U.S. are not very well protected. So um, I presented to them the research on Miami and they said, uh, you don't have to go to the U.S. And I said, why not the U.S.? They said, it's not happening here. So <laughs> that was kind of what we were talking about before that, that and this is the New York Times, so I was a bit shocked, actually, that they said that. So I actually decided uh, to still go to Miami and to, to, go, to go by myself. Uh, because I, I learned that uh, um, Miami had a, has a very particular problem. Maybe somebody knows what the problem is in Miami. Um, which is that uh, Miami is built on limestone. And limestone uh, is not bad to build on, but there's one problem, it's porous. So uh, <laughs> if you, Miami is, you know, it's, it's very vulnerable. There's no, the, the beach is not even real, eh? it's artificial. They bring millions of tons of sand every year to replenish the b beach. Um, so the only way to protect Miami is to basically to build dikes and, uh, or a seawall. So it's often the Dutch, I, d I can't remember how often in this project somebody would say to me, let's call the Dutch, um, to be considered the experts on coastal protection and, and how to, to manage. So the Dutch engineering uh, companies indeed and some others, uh, they all came to Miami to see what if there was a master plan to protect Miami and everybody had to conclude there's not because if you build a dike on limestone uh, and it's porous, the water will just go under. So Miami is considered to be, uh, to be not able to protect. Which is kind of crazy because Miami, this is the, what's considered the most expensive zip code in the US. Uh, so the, like this super expensive real estate. Miami is real estate. So, you know, again, I mean, it's like it questions like how, if you know that this is going to happen and, and there's, honestly, there, don't see, there doesn't seem to be any way to protect Miami, uh, to save Miami in the future, why do you still continue to, to build all the real estate? Um, 
part of the answer is that, that it's being sold to foreigners. They don't know. So it's felt like a little bit like uh, the real dancing on a volcano. Uh, and this is so Miami Beach is also, you know, I mean, probably will have to be evacuated in 20 years from now. They're installing pumps now everywhere. Um, this is... Uh, this is what they, this is very specific, uh, they have very specific expression in Miami. This is what they call sunny day flooding. So it means that the floods, although it's not, it hasn't been raining and, uh, and the skies are blue. So this is, uh, yeah, it's the tide. So there's su such a low lying areas in Miami Beach that, that the, the seawater during high tide comes up through the drainage. <coughs> So yeah, so they're installing pumps now to prevent this, but the problem is that these pumps are either running on electric, on the electricity, or they're running on diesel, with, and, and it's an area which is hurricane prone, so with any heavy storm, uh, the electricity, there's a blackout, so the pumps start, stop working, and then it still floods. So the, I asked the guy what he was doing there, obviously, <laughs> and he said, uh, uh, I'm checking if the sewage is not stuck, if it's if maybe there, if there's no blockage in the sewage, but he said, I'm afraid it's seawater. Um, so, um, well, to be fair to the New York, when I came back and I, I sent the, the the story to the New York Times, they actually run it. So, uh, and they still pay for it, so th to be fair to them. Um, when I was there the last time, there was a hurricane. Hurricane Michael was approaching the north of Florida. Um, nothing new about hurricanes, but uh, you know, I mean, was it the, they're getting stronger, they're getting more frequent, and I wanted to show what happens if, uh, if there's no coastal protection whatsoever. Um, so this was a couple of hours after the hurricane. And uh, it's, it's not so much the wind which caused the damage, it was the storm surge. Um, so they had like a storm surge of, I think, like uh, three meters or so, four meters. And it's just like a bulldozer, like a tsunami, right? <coughs> Well, New York is a, is a bit. Is New York is quite different, actually, compared to Miami, because in New York, they had a wake-up call in uh, 2012, which was called Sandy. Uh, it wasn't even a hurricane; it was called a uh, it was a superstorm. But uh, you may remember the images of, of the Lower Manhattan completely flooded. There was a blackout. So there is a plan now for New York to protect it. There's a master plan. Uh, the problem is uh, that um, the plan is protecting uh, Manhattan, but th there's no plan for Brooklyn or New Jersey or uh, the Bronx or Queens. Or so it looks like now that, that Manhattan will be protected, but the, uh, all the outlying areas will not, and that, uh, that they will still uh, be flooded in the future. Um, they have barrier islands along the east coast. Uh, this, is, this is the Hamptons, which is part of Long Island. Ba barrier islands are barriers, right? They are barriers to protect the, ba the land behind it for storm surges. You're not supposed to build on it. But, uh, so uh, the, the price of the real estate property on those barrier islands dropped after Sandy, but now it's uh, at an all-time high. Um, 
Well, what to say about Jakarta? I initially didn't go to, I didn't want to go to Jakarta because especially when I started to this project, I was very aware that there were a lot of people who were very skeptical uh, that it was humanity who was causing this crisis. Um, so I, because Jakarta has a very specific problem, which is uh, that the city is sinking. And it's sinking because it's been growing so quickly and they are ex extracting too much groundwater. So the city, parts of the city are sinking 25, 30 centimeters a year, uh, really, really rapid. And the sea level is rising as well. So the, 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 the cocktail of those two aspects make, make, makes it probably the most vulnerable city in the world. Um, So this is not taking into account that the city is sinking. This is just what, what happens if the sea level rises one meter. Uh, and uh, this is what happens if it rises two meter. But the city sank. I mean, I've been co coming there a couple of times. You can imagine in a decade, it sank already two and a half meters. Uh, so. 10, 15 years ago, almost the whole city was above sea level. Now most of the city is below sea level. Um, so I didn't go initially because I was afraid that people would say that it's not the problem of the climate, it's the problem of the sinking city. But I think now people understand that the, the combination of the two is, uh, makes it very vulnerable. So again, there was a master plan close the Bay of Jakarta, reclaim land, move the business district. Uh, but financially, it was very complicated. Uh, there was a lot of bureaucracy, and there was a lot of protests as well. People, especially fishermen, who felt that they would lose their livelihoods. He's pr trying to protect his house from flood during high tide. But he is a fisherman. He was the one, one of the main people who were protesting against the closing off of the Bay of Jakarta to, to protect that this would not happen. But he would lose his livelihood because he couldn't fish anymore. So in the end, the government decided now to move the capital. You may, may have heard that. They're building a new capital uh, elsewhere. Um, there seems to be one problem is that they are moving the government, but not the 20 million people. Um, so that makes it really, really, um, I don't know. <coughs> yeah, they build, they've been building uh, as soon as, as fast as they can. They're building seawalls now, but uh, some of them, there's some, let's say, some engineering problems. <laughs> so <laughs> so <laughs> the, the water is on both sides. Um, Um, well, as I, when I was, what, I, what I, I was saying in the beginning, I was, what I was looking for, I was looking, I was researching for areas, regions in the world where there's an urgency. Did you benchmark what's happening around the world with, uh, with, with sunlight? Sorry? Did you benchmark what's happening around the world in your own land on how your country is have dealt with uh, the flooding? We're ga getting there. Um, I mean, I didn't initially include the Netherlands because, um, you know, I was looking for an urgency. And, and you know, I, had to f I wanted to visualize that this is happening already today. The Netherlands, we feel very safe behind our dunes and dikes. So, you know, I mean, th it's not like that we have frequent flooding or, or stuff like that, which, which I would see in Bangladesh or even in Miami. <coughs> At the same time, you know, I mean, uh, the latest report from the Clim International Climate Panel, which they, which they always publish, was for the first time that they uh, also showed the worst case scenario. Uh, so 
they may, they, it's said in the latest report that if, if we don't manage to contain our emissions and, uh, and bring them down as soon as possible, uh, the worst case scenario is that, uh, that we are facing three meters sea level rise by the end of the century. Um, that's a lot. Um, and the Netherlands can deal with one meter, we can maybe deal with two meters, but we cannot deal with three meters. So there is a worst case scenario in the Netherlands, which means that part of the country might have to be relocated. Huh? Where? Yeah, Highland. <laughs> um, but it's it's also a very difficult discussion in the Netherlands because you know I mean if if, if people if people are being told that there is a there that there is a possibility that maybe in the future the city of Amsterdam or The Hague or Rotterdam have has to be evacuated and relocated. It's not it's not a conversation we can we can have yet. It's just not uh, it's even for me, you know, after seeing all this, it's it's very difficult for me to understand that this that there's a possibility. But the the, the, the issue is that it's not a it's not a question if the sea level will rise one meters, two meters, three meters or even five meters. The question is when. But that it will rise is for sure, and that it in the end will be five meters is for sure. The question is when. And uh, you know, I mean, this can only be, th and that's why I think this is like a, a real, uh, you know, you can read it as a call for action because if we, every day we lose, uh, it will have a more serious impact. Um, just to give you a perspective, and we, uh, I have two fellow Dutch in the, in the room, they know, I mean, when, when we had the flood in 1953, we closed, um, we closed all the sea arms. Uh, we, we enforced our dikes. Uh, it was called the Delta Plan. So this is one of the sea arms. It's closed off from the sea now. But it took us 40 years to complete this. We have a tiny coastline <laughs> compared to Bangladesh or anywhere else in the world. So just to give you a perspective how long, how much time we need to do this properly, it uh, makes the clock tick. So we are, you know, again, this is the access of the, of the port of Rotterdam. So in case of a storm, we can close these barriers. The problem is if the sea level rises to, if the sea level starts really rising, that these barriers will be closed permanently and then uh, there's no access to the port anymore. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know how high it is above sea level. Huh? No comments. <laughs> mm Well, you, you know, first of all, it, it took me years 
to, to get this in the media. The New York Times initially was the only newspaper who, who, who was publishing this, and the moment they, they told me that they wanted to participate, it was the very same moment that they uh, dissolved the environmental desk. So d uh, I don't agree with you that, you know, there, there's been far too late and far too little attention. And, you know, th I think we, we, it has been too long that we have been told, don't worry, it's going to be okay. And I'm, you know, I don't think it's going to be okay. You know, if I'm, if I'm very honest, I don't think it's going to be okay. I mean, I hope we can, we can extend this if we, if we act properly and, and collectively and, and we understand that, that small initiatives are obviously so sometimes very important be because they grow to something, something big. But it's local people, it's not often the governments who act, it's the people who act. You know, I mean, it's the people, like, like we in, in the Western world, we have kind of a tendency that we look at the government to act. In Bangladesh or, or Indonesia, people act themselves. They're not going to wait for their government. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I, I think, I don't think there's a lot of visual proof yet, you know. I mean, I'm d talking specifically about this, about this topic. And, uh, you know, I'm not an activist. I'm, I'm a journalist. But, you know, I mean, after all I've seen and, 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 and see how often governments respond to it and don't really want to, to address the issue, I, I don't think it can be, uh, I think the alarm bells really should be erased. And it, sh it should be balanced to, to the good initiatives, but it should not, and that's what we did for many years, that things will be okay. Um, Yeah. I s well, it depends on the media, you know, and and it's easier it's for 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 me as a photographer, it's easier to photograph a disaster than a dis than a solution. I'm I'm very aware of that and it's my responsibility to, to kind of balance that out, but it's also my responsibility, which obviously is not in this presentation, but th that I give people a voice. You know, I interviewed people, and, and I think you were not there, but you know, I, I connected families who were partly already relocated themselves to, to Dhaka in Bangladesh, and then connect, and then visited the remaining family members in, uh, in, in the Delta. And to have their stories told, you know, and I don't know if you, I forgot to tell, there was one picture in Bangladesh where you see uh, these, it's salt, you know, you, s you see, uh, it's, it was black with uh, small uh, pyramids of, of white, it's, it's salt. It was incredible, you know, it's an island in the Bay of Bengal, they used to be rice farmers. Um, but their land got flooded free, uh, all the time by the sea, so they couldn't grow the rice anymore. Some people had this brilliant idea that they would go into salt mining. So all the rice paddies became salt paddies. So, you know, I mean, th those stories are very much included and are very necessary because it's, it's how people, you know, I mean, uh, there's nothing new about that the sea level, the sea level has been much higher before and it has been much lower before, but it never happened in two generations. And we, we, I think we often lost our ability to adapt as well. Uh, you know, I think, okay, the world was, the world population was much smaller, but you know, and, and maybe our forefathers were no nomadic. We would just, you know, also in the Netherlands, we would move to a high land. I uh, don't know how you call it, but we would build small, like, lift our house up. Um, that's not, you know, it's not in our mindset anymore that, that we maybe should move somewhere. Not to say that it's everywhere necessary, but it's...
Um, If I'm honest ab about this specific issue with a, with a rising sea level, uh, I've seen issues which will address it for the next two, one or two decades, but I haven't seen many solutions which will address it uh, for a longer period of time, except uh, 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 relocation. But, but, you know, I mean, the, 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 the master plan for New York which, is, which will cost like $40 billion, has been designed uh, to prevent another Sandy. So it's, Manhattan is going to be protected by a seawall, but it didn't take into account uh, that the sea level will rise. So, you know, I mean, that I, sometimes I, I do get a bit cynical after working <coughs> so many years on it. I, if, if I see how many failures there have been and uh, you know I mean yeah if the palm tree islands are three meters yeah, above the sea level okay that's not so bad the Dutch, uh, the Dutch did it. <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, I mean, I've, it's difficult for me as a as a as a photojournalist as well. How do you balance that 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 you tell a story that people that you you don't di leave completely depressed the room, right? How do you make sure that there's something? Because I agree that you need to to. You, had, you need to give some hope as well that things are can be okay, and uh, I think there's there's much more awareness now, and I think there's much more willingness uh, to act, to act. I think the the climate crisis in in a lot of countries on, is is on the top of the political agenda, so you know I think with at least that that is happening, and uh, again I mean there 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 are initiatives, but if you look on the, on the on a broad scale, and if you see how big cities are today, you know, Jakarta is like 20 million people. Uh, uh, it's, it's sometimes, uh, yeah, tough. Can I, can I ask you two questions? I have a couple of questions on maybe some of us here from the Jakarta who would like to was more a statement than a question. <laughs> but is it working, the microphone? Uh, well, it was a question, not a statement. Uh, yeah, it was a question, not a statement. Uh, I want to ask you whether you have seen a psychological issues with the people, uh, because Sorry, do you hear this? Yeah. 
Okay, I just feel One more time. comfortable this way. Okay, yeah. Uh, have you seen psychological issues with the people? Because, you know, for me, it seems like a big psychological problem because the whole world is changing, like with this COVID situation and everything. The earth obviously is changing, the sea is changing, and the people still stay there and just don't want to move. They want to keep the control over their land and just to know what is happening after that. Do you see a kind of psychological problem with this need to control and to be able to predict what will happen with us, with our families, with our lands? And life is just moving. No, I think it depends a little bit where you are in the world. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, the we in the Netherlands would think for quite a few years that if it would get warmer in the summer, that it would be, that it's actually not so bad because it's pretty cold in the Netherlands. <laughs> Today is a war very warm summer day in the Netherlands. Uh, <laughs> but when it, for two years, we had days that the temperatures became over 40 degrees, then I think some people started to realize that this was not, that this was getting a little extreme. Um, but, it, it, you know, I mean, the, the issue with, with if, it, if you talk about heat or extensive rain or uh, uh, forest fires, so, you know, that's what people start to feel. If, if we talk about this, that's often what we, what we don't directly feel, you know. I mean, so it raises the question if we have a responsibility how to leave this planet for future generations. So, um, but as, as I said earlier, you know, I mean, the, I said earlier that, that many people thought that, that Bangladesh was very depressing, where I s actually thought it was uh, not so depressing because people act themselves, you know. They, they, they have this connection to the sea still. They know what to do when there's a cyclone, they, knew wha they know what to do. So they, they, they will move indeed. Um, so it's, it's maybe us, yes, in a comfort zone who is not really touched by this uh, today. And then, uh, and then it's difficult to, to act and it's, it's difficult to, for a government also to convince the people that, that, that there are large investments uh, needed to, to prevent uh, to secure and, and, and that parts of the country remain safe. For me, it was a really fascinating example with the martial arts uh, um, island because they were able to move from the disaster. Uh, they went to the new place and they found it even bigger disaster, so they uh, preferred to go back to the disaster. Yeah. So sometimes building a new life seems a bigger disaster than actually being well, if you lose if you lose your whole country it becomes problematic um, but to to get to your question i mean as i said you know re research has been incredibly important here and and it in that sense it was good to have the new york times uh, on board because uh, you know all the, with all the research i had to do for where I would go and where I would visit and, and, and what the issue was, I had to give at least two, at least two, three independent sources where I got the information from. Okay, Verifiable started, sources. You started planning uh, by contacting agencies before you start the project? Or you no, project I, start, I just started this project. And then I, then I went to the New York Times, which was kind of coincidence. I didn't expect them to take this project. But y usually I, it usually starts small, you know, I thought I, this is just about Bangladesh. And then it kind of derails and it becomes like this very big global project. But, uh, <coughs> you know, I mean, uh, the, 
I think that, that, and I think that's often underestimated, how many months or even longer of research it goes into, some, in, into something before I actually shoot. Uh, you know, it's maybe two months research and, and one week of shooting. Um, and I think that with, with such topics where you, where you put claims, uh, they have to be verifiable, you know. I, I cannot say, you know, I, if I just have to trust you that the Palm Islands are three meters above sea level and I don't verify it with two, two other independent sources, I have a problem. And there's lots of people who are very skeptical uh, that this is all happening and that this is not true. Yeah, so... Uh, Well, no, I mean, the, uh, the, as I said earlier, you know, I mean, it was initially very difficult to get it published. It was the New York Times who did it, and then, and then it started to resonate, and it was actually published uh, very, very well. Uh, and it became an exhibition. It became a traveling exhibition. It's, I'm here now because it's in the Dutch Pavilion at the World Expo, uh, some of these images. Um, I made, made a television series, so you know I often use all the means because I'm, the w the work I do is because I want to reach a wide audience. You know, I'm not I'm not a photographer to have a show in a museum. If it's in a museum, it's fine, but it's not my my uh, initial goal. And in the end, it became a book, which was not the plan, but. Um, um, it was the a publisher who asked me to do it, and I think what made the book valuable is that I was I was tr I tried to make it into not a photo book. <laughs> so uh, you know, and and I felt that uh, what I'm saying now, as somebody from the Netherlands, in the book, it's this these stories are being told by people who are from there. So it's uh, it's the Kuna who tells the story about Panama. It's, uh, it's a scientist who talks about uh, Greenland, and it's the former president of Kiribati who talks about his country. Um, so I think that made it, uh, so there's still a lo lot of pictures in it, but it has a lot of uh, statistics in it. So what I, what my question was, this book was not planned to be a book. No, be but a book. I don't, I can't. Yeah, uh, you can only make a book if it's if it's good enough. So I cannot say beforehand that it's going to be good enough and that it's going to be a book. So this was only after many many years that it became a book. And I didn't want to make a photo book because I think sometimes the problem with a photo book is is that it's it's very elitist, right? You the publisher will tell you now that he, he or she will make 500 copies and that you should be very happy to that they get sold. So why would you cut the trees for re to reach 500, <laughs> 500 people? So, you know, this was trying to reach a different audience, and and, and that's why I, I like to work for the New York Times or the Washington Post, even more than working for National Geographic, because you reach first of all a very wide audience, but you reach an audience of policymakers and politicians. And if you work for National Geographic, it's great, but you're kind of preaching for your own choir. Um, so I think as a photographer, you, you have to think what you do, how you do it, and who you want to reach. There are three copies for anyone who wants to. think so. Thank you very uh, much. I <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe not, but uh, uh, I lose my voice. I wanted to hear from you more about those nice pictures, but uh, <laughs> we were discussing the climate for the while the slideshow was running. What would, you, would, you, would you have some certain memories with any of the pictures you would like to share with us? Like something that 
Uh, well, it, 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 um, I don't know if, well, you know, with, if you work around hurricanes, it's always risky. And, and when, when the tide is getting high and there's a storm coming, I mean, it is, it is frightening if you know that there's no way to leave. It was inter there's one, pi I don't think, I don't know if I can. It's interesting to, s to see how the process works because I, you know, I concluded this project actually in two 2015. I thought I was done uh, because I thought I was becoming repetitive because how many islands can you show uh, which slowly get flooded? So I closed it. And then there was this idea came up to do a television series and that's how it got revived the whole project. And that made me go back to places I've been. It made me to include places where, which I didn't include before, like the Netherlands. And it, and it uh, made me look at my edit again. And then that's always interesting with uh, photographers, you know, they have, you have to make your own edit, which is, in the film world, you have an editor, it's a profession, right? So somebody who, had, who has a distance from the work and, and, and is building this in, into a story. If you, are, if, it's, if, if you are the author, you are, it's your baby, right? You you almost no, I'm al almost, al sometimes uh, locally I have somebody like who's helping me to translate. I'll carry my own bag, but I sometimes need, uh, yeah, help like that. But um, you know, I mean, I re-looked at my, there's one image which I, I'll, that is the last I'm showing you and then it's, if I can find it. It's not there. <laughs> no, there's, you know, I've, I discovered several images and one of them is in the, in the Dutch pavilion. Uh, and I s see that it's not, it's not here yet. It, I missed that, uh, I'm talking about uh, kids playing soccer on the beach in Kiribati in the Pacific. And I, for, I initially completely overlooked the image until somebody else looked at, at my whole take, found the image, and then I realized that it was not just a picture of, of uh, kids playing soccer at the beach. It was, it's a picture of kids playing soccer at the beach surrounded by sandbags. Uh, so, and it became one of the, my favorite images. Uh, but it it, hol it holds two messages, you know? It holds the message that people, no matter what happens, that they will still try to live a life and that kids, no matter what happens, will still play soccer on the beach, uh, but that they are su surrounded by sandbags, sandbags which, are some s which are very uh, threatening, obviously. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gale. Uh, I think let's take a group photo for the caption. Because we are uh, one one of these. Uh, yeah, I'm selling it. Mm -hmm. uh, how much? Um, for mm -hmm. 40 euros. Okay, uh, how, how to pay this? Uh, 40 euros and 100 at the in the resolution. Um, okay, what's the easiest? Okay, there is a very nice news here. I got it from my colleague. All the attendees will Thomas get the humanity book. Oh, dear arms. Yoo -hoo.